Okay, well, I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Kevin Platt. Uh, Dr. Platt is uh, Edmund and Louise Kahn term professor in the, humanity, uh, in the humanities, professor of Russian and Eastern European studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Platt received his BA from Amherst College and his PhD from Stanford University and taught it at uh, Pomona College before joining the University of Pennsylvania faculty in 2002. He has been the recipient of grants from IRAX and CER, Fulbright Hayes and other programs and was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2011-2012. He works on rep representations of Russian history, Russian historiography, uh, history and memory in Russia, Russian lyric poetry, and global post-Soviet Russian culture. He is the author of Terror and Greatness, um, Ivan and Peter as Russian Myths, and History in a Grotesque Key, Russian Literature and the Idea of Revolution. Uh, and he's also the co-editor of the Epic uh, Revisionism, Russian History and Literature as Stalinist Propaganda. He has also edited and contributed translations to a number of books of Russian poetry in English translation, most recently uh, Hit Parade, the Orbita Group. Uh, his current projects include a critical historiography of Russia, a study of contemporary Russian culture in Latvia, and an edited volume titled Russian Culture and Global Situations. So let's welcome Dr. Platt. Thanks so much for um, that introduction, Maya. And I also just wanted to thank all of you for coming here and uh, FPRI and the Eurasia Program and its uh, leadership and also Rachel Hemmler for really excellent organizational work. Um, a little about me, as you just heard, I'm a specialist primarily uh, in Russian culture and history. Um, but I've spent a lot of time in Latvia over the years. Uh, and I'm finishing a book about the contemporary cultural and social situation of Russians in Latvia. Um, and largely for that reason, I know a thing or two about the history of the Baltic states and of Latvia, which is the subject of my talk with you guys here today. Um, I'm going to return to the situation of present-day Baltic states at the end of this lecture. Uh, but I'll note at the outset that the peculiar situation of the current Russian population of Latvia uh, is a significant outcome of the history that we'll explore here. Uh, and contemporary debates over the status of the Russian population in Latvia are dependent on interpretation of the history of the Latvian national experience uh, as defined by eras of domination and occupation, but also uh, fruitful interaction uh, with the various ethnicities of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Um, like Latvian national development, uh, those of Estonia and Lithuania are also deeply imbricated in a history of relationships uh, with Moscow. Um, just for a few figures to throw things into relief, um, as you probably know, Russians make up a sizable segment of the Latvian population currently, 26.9% according to the 2011 census. And there are another five to 7% of speakers of Russian and other ethnicities that we could add to that number, uh, which by some calculations, statistics are always tricky, um, makes uh, the Russian population of Latvia the largest of any post-Soviet state other than the Russian Federation. Um, the case of Estonia is comparable with Latvia in many ways. Lithuania has a s far smaller number of Russians and is quite distinct in this regard. Um, one question that haunts the Baltics is that of the integration of the Russian population in social and political terms and the corresponding question of the role of Russians, Russian culture, Russian identity in Baltic collective life and Baltic national identities. Um, this is not gonna be the topic of the lecture today. This is the thing that I think about a lot, but I think it reveals to a certain extent the, uh, extent the, the trace of imperial relations on this territory. Uh, the articulation of Baltic national identities and ba Baltic consciousness has always taken place in this contact zone between imperial formations of much larger ethnic groups uh, that have washed over this territory from one direction uh, 
and the other for centuries. Um, so let's just turn to the Baltic nations themselves. Um, at the outset, we have to make a few necessary preambles, uh, both historical and theoretical, before we think through the history of Baltic national experiences. Um, first of all, we should recognize that while there is a great deal of um, commonality, interaction, uh, and community among the Baltic societies, uh, the tendency on the part of more distant observers to lump them together as the Baltics glosses over the really great distinctions between these societies and their histories as well. Um, we'll talk about their distinct paths to, to national self-affirmation a little bit later in this talk, but let's just identify for a start some more fundamental distinctions. Uh, first of all, linguistic. Uh, Latvian and Lithuanian are both in the Baltic language group, uh, which is a subgroup of the Indo-European larger group. Uh, there, uh, these are really the only two Baltic uh, languages, which are languages of state in the modern world. Um, there is some debate about uh, certain varieties of both, uh, whether they might constitute languages uh, or dialects, Latgalian, for instance, which is spoken by a large number of Latvian citizens in the eastern part of the state uh, in Latgalia. Um, you guys all know the old joke about the difference between a language and a dialect. Right? No? The difference between a language and a dialect is an army. <laughs> um, Estonian, uh, in distinction, uh, is a Finno Ugaric language, uh, closely related to thing Finnish, more distantly with Hungarian. Uh, Finno Ugaric languages are not part of the Indo European group, uh, it's a completely structurally different language. Um, but none of these languages is, is, is mutually uh, intelligible. Up until uh, the uh, middle 2000s, there were still internal borders between all the Baltic states. Uh, and it was always um, somewhat of a surprise when you arrived at the borders between Latvia and Lithuania, or Latvia uh, and Estonia, which I did many times, and saw that the lingua franca between the border guards of the separate nations was still Russian. Um, I think uh, it probably would have switched to English by now, um, but the, the, there's a need of, of lingua franca for inter-Baltic uh, communications. Um, and by the way, one of the very few Baltic words that has appeared in many other modern languages uh, is the term Baltic itself, um, which uh, we apply to these languages, to this region, um, but also to the sea, which gives the region its names, the Baltic Sea. Um, Balt uh, is the Baltic root for uh, white, and the Baltic Sea is, is the White Sea. Um, so much for language. We can also think about religious distinctions. Uh, Lithuania, which for much of the late pre-modern and early modern eras uh, was very closely integrated with, uh, the, with Polish political and cultural life. Um, is a society in which Catholicism was the dominant force uh, for a long time, and it's still a you know, predominantly Catholic society. Uh, Latvians and Estonians, uh, where there was a dominance of Baltic German nobility, descended from crusaders that came into this area, and the Hanseatic cities uh, of Riga and Tallinn, uh, was a zone of uh, eventually Protestant, uh, Lutheran, uh, religiosity. Um, in short, these are very distinct societies. Um, it would be possible to give uh, completely separate and dissimilar lectures on the histories of each of them. Um, but we're going to take them all together and think a little bit about those differences as we go through the history of this region. Uh, but it really should be stressed that these are all completely separate contexts in very many ways. All right, let's, let's turn now to a theoretical preamble. Um, we're talking today about national identity, national consciousness, national self-affirmation and culture. So we should think just a little bit of our, about our key term, nation. Uh, as history teachers, you're probably all well aware that nationalisms, nations, are not all alike. 
Uh, political scientists like to make typological distinctions between civic nations or civic nationalisms and uh, ethnic nations or ethno-nationalisms. Uh, the former being defined primarily by a commonality of citizenship, political institutions, economic life, uh, and the shared history that arises from, from these, perhaps. Whereas ethno-nationalism is a conception of the nation as defined by a shared ethnicity um, expressed in culture or language, genealogy, uh, a shared cultural being that is definitive of national life and usually associated with a historical territory which is usually conceived as an ancient birthright. Uh, in practice, these are ideal types. Um, and there's a, a, a kind of a secondary problem of essentialization which often afflicts national, nationalism studies where specific nations are typecast as one or the other. Um, some could say, of course, that the United States is an example of you know, civic nationalism, perhaps you know, the best and proudest example of civic forms of national identity, uh, or that the, the Baltic conceptions of nationhood, at least as some would define them, uh, gravitate towards the second, towards ethnic considerations. Uh, but in fact, any given national identity uh, or nation formation is, first of all, unique uh, and always a work in progress. Um, it's easy to find Americans uh, who wish to or will uh, emphatically claim that there is a civilizational or even genealogical basis of American culture in the English language uh, and roots of the United States in colonial settler populations from England. It's, you don't have to go far to find, in fact, uh, American ethno-nationalists. Um, likewise, uh, the idea of civic nationalism has historically played a very significant role in the Baltic states. Uh, and in all of the Baltic states today, the problem of national identity and nationhood has been uh, and continues to be at issue. Uh, it's an ongoing situation of political and social contestation over how civic and ethnic ideas are to be properly combined uh, in articulating collective identity, citizenship, and a just settlement of a history that was patently unjust. So uh, let's return to that history a little bit. All three of the Baltic peoples experienced the rise of national consciousness uh, in the course of the 19th century, which was the age of rising nationalism across Eastern Europe, uh, more generally as smaller ethnic and linguistic groups, uh, which had historically formed subjects of Habsburg, Swedish, Russian imperial formations, uh, one by one came to recognize themselves as nations or not, you know, there are lots of ethnicities and languages in Eastern Europe that did not, in fact, nationalize in the course of the 19th century. And we could think, for instance, about the Prussians, uh, the other uh, uh, linguistic group from, uh, subgrouping from the, the Baltic language group. Um, Prussians were, by and large, absorbed into German society and state formations. Uh, no one spoke Prussian after the end of the 19th century, basically. Um, for all three of the Baltic peoples, um, the process uh, could be well described in the terms of Miroslav Krach, uh, who is a great historian of Eastern European nationalisms. It's also been well described by people like Eric Hobsbawm, uh, or more recently, Ron Suni. Um, nationalization was the outcome of many different factors. The modernization of these territories that brought urbanization uh, and education to many of these people, uh, which made possible uh, the dissemination and assimilation of nationalist ideologies uh, among educated elites and that eventually through to urban uh, literate populations. Uh, nationalist ideologies that themselves had been articulated in the end of the late 18th century uh, in the early 19th century by Herder, subsequently German Romantic nationalist philosophers. Um, so this process of the sort of articulation of a national idea uh, took place in each of the Baltic states, all of which were incorporated uh, 
uh, in the Russian Empire up until the revolutions of 1917. Uh, yet the process of national self-articulation uh, had significant distinctions between the three Baltic uh, cases. Uh, as I said, there were distinct not only in terms of religion and language, but also in terms of history. Uh, Lithuania, in its nationalizing imaginings, uh, could draw on a very deep history of independent statehood uh, in the context of um, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, most uh, emphatically in the, the late pre-modern era. Despite the fact that in that era in which Lithuania leached largely assimilated to Polish and Latin cultural forms, um, and so therefore it was an era which really bequeathed very little by way of literary culture um, to modern Lithuanian uh, cultural life, it was still a, a, there was still a, a lingering sense of state identity uh, which was available for Latvian nationalizing elites in the late 19th century, uh, Lithuanian, sorry. The Latvian and Estonian peoples uh, in distinction had been largely rural populations uh, ruled over from the Middle Ages by Baltic Germans who since the early 18th century had been servants of the Russian imperial power. But there are other imbalances between these, these, these cases. Uh, in the course of the 19th century, Latvia and Estonia experienced modernization uh, to a much greater and more rapid degree than did Lithuania, uh, which remained more thoroughly rural and more thoroughly agricultural. Uh, so that by the turn of the 20th century, cities like Tallinn and Riga had become really major urban centers with rapidly developing industry and professional classes, uh, and a large number of urbanized, educated uh, elites drawn from the Estonian and Latvian populations. You can compare that with Vilnius, which was still a predominantly Jewish and Polish commercial city at the end of the 19th century. Uh, in each of these cases, uh, the rise of national consciousness uh, takes place at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th with the appearance of these educated elites, the categorization of national cultural forms, the articulation of written languages, literary languages, publications of newspapers and literature, and the coalescing of political sensibilities. Uh, without going too deeply into the history of those processes, we can note that it was aided at times by the elites of dominant ethnic groups. Uh, the first collectors of folklore uh, and song culture in the area were German intellectuals generally, um, but also that it was actively impeded uh, by imperial Russian policies uh, that prohibited printing and education uh, in local languages, uh, on and off again actually, and pursued start and stop policies of Russification across the area, uh, especially towards the end of the century. Um, one other thing that we should really note uh, is the importance of song in this area. Song in Herdurian conceptions of nationalism was privileged everywhere. Um, German conceptions of nationalism also, romantic nationalism also stressed music and song as some of the most important bearers of national identity and national sensibility. Uh, but song became extraordinarily important across all three of the Baltic states as one of the most important bearers and expressions of national identity. Uh, the first Latvian festival of song takes place in 1873. It's a, a large scale festival, but in the course of the next hundred and how many years has it been since then, uh, song festivals have become regular features of the cultural life across all of the Baltic states, uh, places where the nation comes together to recognize itself. And if you think about the scale of these societies, um, you know, these are very small countries. Uh, they're places where, you know, Benedict Anderson famously describes, uh, you know, modern nationalism as the, the question of imagined communities because you can't actually see everyone else in the nation. You actually, you have to imagine the nation. These are places that are almost small enough that you can see everyone. Um, <laughs> And that really is the, the, the feeling that you get if you go to uh, like the Nat Latvian National Song Festivals. There's tens and tens of thousands of people gathering together singing in these mass choral experiences. Um, so a song becomes extraordinarily important and it, and it remains important throughout the rest of the, the modern era, both within Latvia throughout it, all of its troubled history, but also, and the other Baltic states, but also outside of it as a very important form for the maintenance of cultural identity 
by diasporic uh, Baltic populations across the world uh, during the Soviet era. Um, all right, by the time of the 1905 revolution, these processes had coalesced in organized political activity across all three of the Baltic states. Um, during the, the 1905 revolution, the expression of national political mobilization was most thoroughly expressed in Latvia and Estonia, uh, where in this history, it's often difficult to disentangle socialist revolutionary consciousness from national consciousness at this time. Uh, revolutionary mobilization in these territories energized people both in calls for national autonomy uh, but also, and even independence, uh, but also in straightforward calls to overthrow the czarist order, uh, the capitalist or landowner order, the German landlords, etc. Uh, revolutionary disorders in Estonia and Latvia were extraordinarily extensive um, and as in other parts of the Russian Empire, were suppressed by force uh, with a great deal of bloodshed and violence involving hundreds of fatalities and thousands of executions. Over half of the executions during the 1905 revolution uh, that were carried out by the Russian imperial state were carried out in Latvia and Estonia. It was a major center of revolutionary unrest. Now, Lithuania, because it was less urbanized and therefore had less mobilized urbanized populations and also less proletarians, uh, was a less um, uh, extreme case. As elsewhere uh, in the Russian Empire, 1905 set the stage for the revolutions of 1917 uh, and the subsequent period uh, of independence. The, the legalization of political parties in the post-1905 uh, order, the concessions granted by the throne, uh, allowed the public articulation of national political ideals across these societies, uh, so that when the 1917 revolution took place, national actors, nationalist actors, were ready to take advantage of the opportunity to claim independent statehood that was presented by a really somewhat unique concatenation of events. The independent statehood of the Baltic nations arose out of the confluence of revolution and war across this territory. It's a very complicated set of stories that unfolds quite variously, once again, across the three societies. But the general course of events uh, was a result of the tumultuous conclusion of World War I in this territory. Germany had extended its control over nearly all of the Baltic territory and acted to encourage the creation of independent states here in order to diminish the revolutionary Russian regime, uh, which was itself too weak and embattled in the early years to stake its claim here. Uh, yet Germany, too, was weak, too weak to create the puppet regimes that were probably intended for this area. Uh, and while the Bolsheviks had some adherents in the Baltics, especially in Latvia, but also in Estonia, uh, they turned out to be just completely politically inept and basically lost the popularity battle with more nationally inclined Baltic political leaders. As a result, uh, 1919, 1920 through 1940 became the first era uh, of Baltic independence. Uh, we don't have time to dwell extensively on this period or any of these periods, um, except to note that each of these societies uh, during this period witnessed the articulation, uh, the articulation of national culture and political institutions and identities, literature, art, journalism, and other forms of national public life in really full flowering. Um, each of these states uh, was born as a multi-ethnic society. And this returns to the, to the point about civic nationalism. The, the starting point for each of these states uh, was a parliamentary democracy form uh, in which nationalism uh, took something of a backseat to civic, or ethnic nationalism, took something of a backseat to civic forms of nationalism. Citizenship in these states was extended initially to members of all ethnicities uh, in expressions of civic conceptions of nationhood that were really well represented among intellectuals and political elites across these societies in the early years of independence. Uh, it also has to be said that ethnic nationalist ideas were also quite important and well 
represented among the elites of these societies. Um, and in a reflection of the trends in Europe as a whole of the interwar period, each of these societies uh, witnessed the slow rise in prominence of ethnic conceptions of nationhood. Each of these states also uh, moved uh, through a series of coups that took place across the region, different places at different times, from the more liberal parliamentary forms of government that they had started with towards authoritarian dictatorships um, that were uniformly uh, in charge of the Baltic states by the end of the 1930s. So um, this is perhaps the most well-known part of the story that I'm telling here today. Uh, is the end of the first era of Baltic independence. Uh, as we know, it takes place with the outbreak of World War II. Uh, as a result of the secret negotiations between the USSR and Nazi Germany in 1939, uh, in connection with the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact of August 1939, Stalin and Hitler basically divided the Baltic region into spheres of influence. Um, in early, there's a map, which if I had been preparing uh, more assiduously this morning for this, I would have shown you, but it's a straightforward map that was attached as a secret protocol uh, showing the Baltic and the dividing line between the Soviet and German spheres of influence inscribed across the territory of the Baltics. Um, in early 1940, uh, by fiat, as the Nazis were taking control of Poland and moving into Western Lithuania, the uh, Soviet Union ex expanded by fiat uh, and occupied and annexed the Baltic states as new republics of the USSR. Um, and so we arrive at the area, uh, the era of Soviet occupation, uh, which was to last until 1991. Now, before we consider the challenges that these societies faced uh, under Soviet rule and how they managed to meet these challenges, uh, let's consider for a minute the question of Soviet nationalities policy more broadly. Uh, in theory, of course, the Soviet state was founded on positions of Marxist internationalism, uh, which one would think would have little use for the concept of nation or nationhood. Uh, the, Baltic, uh, the Bolsheviks, however, had inherited an empire when they came to power in Petrograd in 1917, and this presented them with many pragmatic problems. What should be done about the huge number of non-Russian ethnicities of the empire, as well as the national independence movements that were clamoring for autonomy in many regions of the empire? Uh, Marxist internationalism aside, the Bolsheviks could not simply ignore national groups and assimilate them, claiming that nationalist sentiment was a myth. No one was going to buy that. Uh, what about rights to speak languages? to do one's thing? What about rights to autonomy? What about the unequal political rights which seemed to persist between Russians and Russian speakers who were in charge of the revolutionary state and everyone else? Wouldn't the domination of everyone else by the Russian Bolshevik party just be a continuation of imperialism? Secession and national independence movements would surely get a lot of steam out of this and the whole enterprise would fail. So Lenin came up with a formula which was later carried on and continued, uh, but also modified by Stalin, uh, the Bolsheviks would in fact recognize nations and give them tons of rights, many, many rights. They would have every right imaginable, in fact. Language, education, artistic expression via national theaters and orchestras. Each nation would have its own administrative unit. Territories, the nationals in each territory would be given proportionally greater roles in running things uh, in proportion to the representation of those uh, peoples on the territories in question. Minorities of all types would be given every possible attribute of independent cultural and political life, uh, except that they would not have the right to secede or they would have it only uh, on paper. They would have every right except for that one. Uh, all of this was intended to ensure that non-Russians would feel good and protected in the USSR. Lenin was most concerned about what he termed great Rus Russian chauvinism, uh, Russian nationalism. Uh, the other nations had to be convinced that the Russians were not just maintaining a Russian empire, and this meant that the one nationalism 
that was not allowed was Russian nationalism. For Marxist theorists in the 1920s, it was thought perhaps that once the USSR had achieved communism and the state withered away, nations wouldn't matter anyway. Nations would wither away too, probably, or maybe they would become less important. Uh, that was the hope, at least. The long-term theoretical view, still consistent with Marxist theory, was that nations would eventually disappear once the world revolution was complete and the communist society was created. But that future state was put off indefinitely. In the 1930s, the, st the situation shifted yet again, when in reflection of cultural and political trends everywhere, and in an expression of the rise of dictatorial uh, Stalinism, which consolidated its control over the Soviet Union, Russian nationalism was revived as well as a component of Soviet patriotic sentiment. Uh, in the late 1930s, Russian was made, once again, a mandatory language of education everywhere in the USSR. You could choose not to, to study your uh, Republican language, but you had to study Russian no matter where you are in which of the Soviet republics you were born uh, from 1937 on. Uh, Russian historical figures and heroes came to be celebrated as the most important in the pantheon of Soviet historical figures in the 1930s became the era when the Russian czars were rediscovered as predecessors of the Bolsheviks. This unfolding of Russian, uh, of Soviet nationalities policy in practice was fraught and complex. Uh, the result, as it has been described by historian Yuri Slyoskin in a seminal article, was that the Soviet Union was constructed in the same manner as a communal apartment. Um, and if you haven't read that article and you're interested in Soviet nationalities policy, it's one to read. It's called The Soviet Union as a Communal Apartment. And it was published, I think, around 2001. Uh, or two in, I believe, in the Slavic Review. But it's easy to find. Yuri Slyoskin, who has this great mega book out right now, um, The Government House, or The House of Government. So a communal apartment in which each Soviet nationality had a room, and the Russians had the hall. The Russians were the landlords. Um, every nationality had its place in the Soviet universe uh, as the you know, national ethnic landscape of Soviet society was constructed. Uh, each nationality had territory, cultural and political institutions. But Russian was the lingua franca, and its cultural institutions were identical with all Soviet cultural institutions. While there were uh, Ukrainians and Moldovans and Chuvash and Adjarians and Mordvinians, and they all had their own theaters, they all had their own writers' unions, they all had their own territories, they all had their own communist parties. There was no separate Russian theater, there was no separate Russian communist party, there was only Soviet theater and the Soviet communist party. Uh, we should make a couple more notes concerning Soviet nationalist policy before we return to the Baltics. First of all, the Soviet institutionalization of nation was both territorial and individual, um, which is to say, not only did each national group uh, have a territory, but also each person had an ethnic nationality, uh, which from the 1930s on was inherited and inscribed at birth in passports that were issued universally uh, at that point. Well, issued, but then not actually given to everyone because the Russian peasants never got their passports until the 1970s uh, in order to keep them on the land. Um, the Passport national, nationality uh, was in some sense another part of the Soviet policy towards protection of the rights of cultural minorities from the 1920s and 1930s, right? Everyone had to be protected. So Ukrainians in Belarus needed to be identified by the state so that they could be protected from the majority culture of the Belarusians. So that if you have a majority Ukrainian village, we can know that, and the majority Ukrainian village can have a, a majority Ukrainian village Soviet. Um, but it's an odd outcome in some sense. Uh, we could easily imagine a very different settlement of the early Soviet problem of nationalities, in which perhaps territories remain linked with national identities, but passports are linked to territories. So that a Ukrainian born in Belarus might have a Ukrainian passport, 
Uh, in part, this is all a reflection of the uh, sort of settling of Soviet conceptions and of Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist conceptions of the nature of nationalism back towards essentialistic kinds of positions. By the end of Stalin's reign, uh, he rewrote the linguistic theories of the, of the Soviet Orthodox uh, academic um, establishment in order to insist that in fact, language and national identity were the innate reflections of unchanging historical essences that came with peoples, that they wouldn't in the end just disappear, uh, that they would in fact persist in some form in the future communist society. Um, the other peculiarity that I wanna to touch upon before coming back to the Baltics is conceptual. Uh, in the 1930s, as nationality policy was taking its final shape, the Soviet state also imposed a unified cultural form, a unified system of aesthetics on Soviet society, uh, which was called socialist realism. One of the key formulas of socialist realism governing the way that this new cultural orthodoxy was to be implemented in the non-Russian cultures of the USSR was national in form, socialist in content. Uh, it's, a, it's a revealing formula with regard to the place of nation in the USSR. Nation in the mature Soviet settlement was ornament. It wasn't political content. Uh, we can easily contrast this with more usual conceptions of national being that are perhaps more familiar in the world that we live in, uh, in which ethnic national being is imagined not as an ornament, but as a deep essential content which is expressed in national culture. You carry around your, your nationhood on the inside. But in the Soviet political orthodoxy, nation was something that could be put on like a costume and worn around over a deeper commonality of socialist political forms or experience. Um, I've got a few nice examples here of socialist realist culture. You know, national in form, you know, the carpet, but socialist in content. And I think it's a, a beautiful ex, uh, exhibit in that sense. Central Asian carpet. This one is nice, too. Um, all right, let's return to the situation of the Baltic states in the Soviet era. Uh, first of all, the history of the occupation was a truly enormous, traumatic, and uh, tragic chapter in the histories of all of these societies. Uh, the Soviets rolled in in, the, in 1940 and the first thing they did, of course, was to begin Sovietizing the, the Baltic states. One of the key moves was to arrest and deport thousands, tens of thousands of elites. Um, immediately following this, the, and you know, with, within a year, the Germans rolled in and we have the trauma of the war, uh, which results in mass displacements of uh, additional uh, huge elements of these societies. Um, immediately following the war, the Soviets come back in and repeat the process again with more mass deportations, uh, which culminate in collectivization uh, of the agricultural systems at the end of the 1940s, which result in more mass deportations. Uh, as a result, the you know, deportation of peoples from this area is maybe 200, 250,000 people. But we should also take into consideration the huge numbers of displaced people that left during the war never to return. Uh, so there was an enormous loss of population as a result of this traumatic decade. Um, the response of the Soviet state was to replace that population with huge influxes of Russians and other non-Baltic populations. Um, there were something like six or 700,000 Russians and other Soviet uh, nationals who entered into the Baltic, basically replacing the populations that had been lost to displacement and deportation in uh, the 1940s. Uh, this was a, a phenomenon which affected, once again, uh, this territory, these states, unequally. Uh, because Latvia and Estonia 
had more living space in their urban centers. These became the objects of much more intensive population replacement on the part of the Soviet Union. They were also, because they were already more industrialized, slated for more industrial expansion in the Soviet economic planning. And so throughout the rest of the Soviet era, you have a continuous trickle of uh, new in migration from the rest of the Soviet Union into these territories. Um, because Lithuania was less developed um, and more urban, also possibly because there was more partisan activity in, Lit in Lithuania, uh, there was less of this initial push of Soviet populations into Lithuania. Uh, and that explains to some extent the difference in statistics that we'll see at the end of the Soviet era. The result of this huge influxes, which are really not comparable to the experience of any other Soviet states, um, is a huge overhang of Russian culture and Russian social pressure within these societies. There's an ongoing process of Russification of cultural life as a result of these huge influences. Uh, Russians by the late Soviet era in Latvia and Estonia felt absolutely no need of local languages or of integration in Latvian culture because A, they were dominant, but also because they were in the majority in the major population centers. So that the Latvia's uh, you know, major population is half of it is located in Riga. By the end of the Soviet era, over half of the population of Riga was Russophone. Similar things could be said about Tallinn less fully the case, but it's comparable. Uh, yet the Baltic peoples were not without resources uh, in this fairly awful situation. Like other Soviet nations, they had the benefit of uh, the claim, at least, to their own national cultural institutions, and they were expected to continue to create culture. Uh, no one was talking about turning Latvians into Russians, and in fact, to be a good member of Soviet society, a non-Russian member of Soviet society, one had to produce one's non-Russian identity at the same time as one reiterated one's loyalty to the Soviet construction of that identity and the place of that identity in the Soviet identity landscape. Uh, we could identify four different strategies of resistance. Um, the first that I'd like to think about a little bit is Aesopian expression. Um, so I have here a poem that we could look at uh, that was written in 1967 by the Estonian poet Jan Kaplinski uh, and published in the you know, Soviet official press. We need to walk very quietly, eyes on ground. You don't need to ask, what are we looking for? A long time ago our land became yours and our state fell down in shards into the big and empty world which is about American Indians, um, right? So this straightforward approach to the, the question of Aesopian language, using the possibilities for expression which are allowed for you uh, to allegorize your situation. And this is a very common strategy in the cultural life across this region. Um, this is another example. Um, also from Estonia, uh, Fight with a Dragon uh, by Yuri Arak. It uh, was made in 1979, shortly after a student uprising in Tallinn that was demanding uh, the protection of Estonian cultural rights, was brutally suppressed. The students were sent to the Gulag. Um, Fight with a Dragon, where we have this you know, red dragon and the absorption of the resistor of George, I guess he is. Um, but the allegory is really not hard to read. Uh, a second strategy for cultural resistance, for the uh, you know, persistence of national self-expression uh, is samizdat. Uh, and dissonant activity. So that all of these territories uh, following the late 1960s, and as we know, the Soviet Union experienced uh, a period of uh, liberalization, um, although it's, there's some debate over the uh, appropriateness of that term in the 1960s under Khrushchev, uh, which resulted in what my 
colleague at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, Ben Nathans, likes to call the, the vegetarian era of Soviet history. Uh, a period in which the penalties uh, for resistance and for deviation from the rule uh, were far less extreme than they had been in the Stalinist era. Um, and it's as a result of this that we see across the Soviet Union the rise of both dissidents and of various uh, alternative media systems, samizdat, uh, which is the Russian word for uh, it's a self-publishing. Uh, all of the Baltic states became huge centers for the creation of non-official uh, manuscript literature, samizdat, as well as for magnitizdat, the circulation of uh, cassette tapes with prohibited or non-official materials. Um, dissident activity across these territories as well. We see in the 1970s and into the early 1980s uh, the rise of dissident groups. Uh, there's a Helsinki 76 group uh, which forms in uh, Latvia. There are nationalist groups which form in Lithuania and in Latvia across this territory. They're all persecuted quite energetically by the KGB, as dissidence was everywhere in the Soviet Union, uh, yet they persisted. Um, and then a third uh, strategy uh, for cultural survival. If we think about these national communities more broadly than simply thinking about their place in the Soviet Union is emigration. Uh, so significant populations um, existed in diaspora all through the Soviet period especially in the United States, carrying out, as we said earlier, their own song festivals. And these populations, uh, in some sense, were carriers of culture. Um, the you know, numbers of Latvians or Estonians or Lithuanians who actually returned following the end of the Soviet Union is negligible, um, numbering in the tens of thousands, I think, in these societies. Uh, yet the return of national culture, of song culture, the 1990 Song Festival in, in Riga is remembered actually as the moment when there was a huge returning wave of diasporic Latvians to take part in the Song Festival. Uh, and it was also one of the, one of the moments, uh, one of the key moments in the so-called singing revolution, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and then finally, I think the, it has to be said that most importantly, culture itself uh, and cultural expression uh, was one of the key means of uh, the persistence of national identity in the Baltic states throughout the, the Soviet era. Uh, because of the formula, nationalist in form, socialist in content, uh, the creation of culture in the Soviet Union, uh, culture bearing national characteristics was not in and of itself viewed as threatening to the Soviet project. So Soviet song festivals corralled, of course, into politically correct positions, but nevertheless, uh, song festivals continued to be held throughout the era of Soviet occupation. Um, and although you couldn't sing anti-Soviet songs, and certain nationalist songs were prohibited, there were nevertheless occasions for national self-expression. And I think that that really is the, one of the keys to the persistence of national identity throughout the Soviet Union, not just in the Baltic states, uh, it's the peculiarities of the, Balt of the Soviet constructions of national identity which construed national expression as something which could be emasculated uh, or rendered politically neutral. Um, but it was that construal which allowed the persistence of national culture throughout the Soviet Union, creating the basis on which national cultures could be revived in the post-Soviet era when the formulation of the significance of these cultures, cultural expressions for identity, once again uh, reverted to the more familiar positions that we uh, uh, find normal in the world. Um, all right, let's quickly talk about the end of the Soviet Union, uh, and then there'll be a little bit of time for discussion. Um, I'll have to run over this more quickly, I guess, if we're gonna have any time for discussion, right? I've got about 20 more minutes? 25. 25, okay. So, as we know, uh, Gorbachev came to power without any true intent to liberalize Soviet society. Uh, the perestroika 
process was intended as a revival of Leninist orthodoxy that was going to reinvigorate the Soviet project uh, that had lost steam during the long period of what came to be known as stagnation in the Gorbachev uh, historical rhetoric. Chernobyl was one of the key events that changed the, the character of Perestroika. Uh, the Chernobyl uh, catastrophe about which populations of Eastern Europe learned as a result of broadcasts from the Voice of America and Radio Free Europe was the key moment which um, forced the Soviet state and forced Gorbachev to initiate newer policies and a reinterpretation of the policy of glasnost that allowed for political, uh, well not political, but first of all, uh, anti-bureaucratic um, criticisms, which very shortly in the course of the late 1980s morphed into platforms for independent political expression. Uh, it was in this context that the Baltic states saw the remobilization of uh, national political consciousness in public in the Soviet Union, the reemergence of national organizations uh, in the fabric of Soviet society. Uh, some of the key events uh, were also completely linked to the Chernobyl catastrophe, mobilizations against huge new industrial projects that had been set um, for the late 80s and early 90s in the Soviet Union by central planning. The Daugava hydroelectric station, uh, phosphate mining expansions in Estonia, and the construction of a Riga metro. Uh, movements, public movements against these were oriented towards the environmental damage that they were going to cause, but these were also movements that were highly conscious of the demographic effects that huge new industrialization projects would bring to the Baltic states. By this time, by the end of the Soviet era, the population of ethnic Russians in Latvia, which is the most extreme case, had reached 34%, with maybe another 10% of non-Latvian Russian speakers of various kinds. Uh, the probability that the hydroelectric project and the uh, Riga metro project would present the tipping point at which, Lat at which Latvians became a minority within their own republic was extraordinarily high. Uh, and so this mobilization waves were oriented both towards environmental, but also towards demographic and national cultural considerations. Uh, a second feature of the uh, national revivals uh, that marked the Baltic um, uh, breakdown of the Soviet Union uh, were the song festivals and singing demonstrations, which took place across the area. Um, song in this period becomes one of the main tools of political demonstration both in the context of official, uh, um, official events, but also in the context of demonstrations, which make song into the main tool of expression. And then a final component that we should talk about is history. Uh, history was one of the main flashpoints for uh, the transformation of Soviet public life in the late 1980s. Now, Glasnost was in originally intended as a, a vehicle for uh, critique of present-day abuses and present-day failings of the Soviet system. But very soon, it became a vehicle for the expression of alternate versions or true versions of the history of the Soviet Union that had long been under wraps. In the Baltic area, one of the most uh, crucial was the history of the, so uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, the Soviet Union had denied the authenticity of the protocols to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact since they had been revealed in the late 1940s in the West. Um, it was a, a continuous uh, flashpoint of Latvian dissidents who uh, repeatedly brought up the secret pro protocols in court cases and trials of dissidents uh, from the late 1970s and into the early 1980s. Uh, in the late 80s, the recognition of the authenticity of these documents became one of the chief demands of political mobilization in uh, the, the Baltic states. It was the basis for the 1989 Baltic Way demonstration, uh, which was a human chain running through all three of the Baltic states and their capitals, uniting millions of people 
uh, in commemoration of the August 23rd signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact 50 years earlier. And it was shortly after that in the December of 1989 that the Congress of People's Deputies of the Soviet Union recognized the authenticity of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which paved the way for the Supreme Soviet of Latvia and uh, of the other, uh, I think actually Lithuania does it first. I'm more familiar with the Latvian case, but they all declared basically uh, independence uh, and the illegality of the Soviet occupation of the Baltic states. Um, I don't want to take any more time. I want to stop. Uh, what I want to say in conclusion, uh, a couple of comments to think about. First of all, uh, there's this term masterpieces of history. And if we think about the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, there was a lot of bloodshed around various parts of the Soviet Union. The Baltics are amazing, a masterpiece of history in the sense that this is a territory in which uh, to an uh, educated observer looking in 1989 and 1990, you had all the makings of major inter-ethnic conflict, uh, which didn't happen. And this very often now that there is a you know, long history of recriminations about the course of post-Soviet Baltic uh, statehood, citizenship, social integration, et cetera. But one thing that has to be said about these territories is that these societies managed the transition to the post-Soviet era in an extraordinarily peaceful way. Uh, the number of deaths was very small, and they resulted only from conflicts with the interior ministry troops that were mobilized in 1991 uh, in a short-lived crackdown on Baltic independence movements that was pretty much immediately uh, resisted by mass action. Um, you have to give some credit to, to Russian and Soviet political elites that basically lost their nerve uh, and Gorbachev pulled back from any serious crackdown on independence movements. We should also though uh, recognize that there are ongoing problems um, and the problem uh, which remains across this region, and which I think is growing more acute in present as a result of the reinscription of hard borders between West and East across this territory, is the problem of successor populations. Uh, what to do with the legacy population of Russians, how to articulate and recapture the civic national roots that these societies actually were founded upon in the early 1920s and create a society in which everyone will find their place, uh, but everyone will feel that they can buy in. So I think I'm gonna stop it with that. We have about 15 minutes for questions, if people have them. Uh, thank you for your attention. I see a hand here and then here. In, uh, in forging uh, nations and empires, uh, to what extent, if at all, did uh, Latvian and Lithuanian collaboration with the Germans in exterminating uh, Jews among their populations, does that inform their identity today? I guess I don't need the mic. Right. <laughs> so the question of collaboration is a, is a huge one across Eastern Europe. And it has to be said that in thinking about Europe as a whole, the society which has dealt best with the legacy of Nazism uh, is Germany. Um, the, on, on one hand, it has to be said that all of these uh, states have made uh, very significant uh, strides towards writing the history of collaborationism. At the same time, it also has to be said that there is a significant tendency among some segments of these populations to simply a whitewash or ignore this very significant history. Um, it's a major problem. What I think is an even more major problem, however, is the way that ethnic politics and also interstate politics managed to uh, weaponize this history on both sides of the, of the problem. So that uh, on the one hand, you have the production more and more over the last 20 years uh, of uh, anti-Baltic histories uh, that paint the Baltic collaboration role uh, as in, in far starker terms uh, than it probably should be, and that paint the present politics of 
um, uh, denial of collaborationism uh, in far starker terms than they should be painted. At the same time, on the other hand, you get the you know, reaction on the part of certain segments of the Baltic population and Baltic society, uh, which perceives uh, any recognition of this history of collaboration as a smear campaign against their society, which has to be uh, resisted. Uh, and more and more recently, it's uh, identified as an, uh, a Russian anti-Baltic uh, smear campaign. Uh, so that I think that you know, we work ourselves into a deadlock where these societies are not able to actually have a, a rational conversation about this. The, the history becomes a, a political tool on both sides, unfortunately. <laughs> I think it's, it's also indicative of the, the situation. Um, there were, I think, about 50,000 Jews in Latvia, once again, it's the case I know best, uh, at the end of the Soviet era. There are only 5,000 Jews left. Um, this is a debate which takes place in the absence of the populations to, uh, that it affects. Um, so that um, there's a, a kind of a strange haunting of the territory by the genocide of the Jews, which is not something which is talked about enough in these territories. Um, my wife's family, her grandmother came from Vilkaviskis, which is a little town near the Polish border in Lithuania. And I remember we went um, to visit there uh, about four years ago. Vilkaviskis was the third um, most important center of Jewish culture in this territory, Vilnius, uh, Warsaw, and Vilkaviskis, a major synagogue, a major center of Jewish culture. It was also very near the um, Polish border, so it was one of the first places the Nazis came when they rolled into the Lithuanian territories. Um, and the population was entirely wiped out. Everyone was killed. Um, there are no Jews at all in Vilkaviskis now. All that's left is the Jewish cemetery. Um, but the Jewish cemetery is this extraordinarily uh, sort of ghostly site. If you go to the center uh, of the town, you can find like a little sign pointing down an alley that leads to the Jewish cemetery. Um, and you walk into it. The grass is long. It's apparently mowed only once a year. And there are snail shells. Um, so you're walking and this crunching as you're going through this, this uh, cemetery. And uh, it is maintained in a state of desecration that it was left. 50 years ago. Uh, all of the uh, monuments are knocked down. There are bullet holes. Um, it's also apparent that the local population doesn't come there, even though it's in the center of a populated ter uh, territory. Uh, so it is, it is a serious um, problem, one which has to be considered. Um, but it's also one which right now is almost impossible to consider in a rational way in these societies as a result of the extreme polarization of historical memory. Uh, your question? Yes, uh, I was wondering how much demographic change has occurred in the Baltics since they became independent again in 91. Uh, have uh, the Russians generally decided to hold on, or was there some outflow yeah. at some point? So um, once again, the Latvian case is the one that I know best. Lithuania is very different from uh, the Latvian case. There were 9.6% of the population Russians at the end of the Soviet era. Um, and I think now it's probably down to like 5%, but I do not know the precise figure now. Uh, Estonia had, I think, 30%, 30.4 or something at the end of the uh, Soviet era. And I'm not sure how much that one has shrunk. In Latvia, this is the case that I know the figures well. Uh, the Russian population, as we said, was 34% at the end of the Soviet era with another 10% or so of Russian speakers. That's another very complicated question, right? Who is a Russian in this territory? Russian is a uh, notoriously messy ethnicity, uh, which is you know, usually comprised, you, you, you ask a Russian who their grandparents were, and it turns out they are a Lithuanian, a Pole, a Jew, and uh, you know, a, a Georgian. But in any case, right, so you have 34. It's now down to 24% um, ethnic Russians, uh, with probably another you know, 7 or 8% uh, Belarusians and, and Ukrainians. 
So there has been significant outflows. That's in terms of percentages, and I don't know the total numbers, but the other thing which has to be said about the demographics of all of these states uh, in the era of the European Union is that they've seen enormous outflows of populations. Um, first, Russians who left. Uh, and the citizenship policies, especially in Latvia and Estonia, were adopted with an eye towards encouraging Russians, especially members of the military, uh, to not decide to stick around following uh, the end of the Soviet era. So there was a quite significant outflow uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. But then since then, there's been ongoing outflows because of the lack of economic opportunity in all of these territories. And once again, that's a very complicated story. There are ups and downs, um, and it's quite different from state to state. Uh, but it's safe to say that all of them are experiencing really quite significant economic shrinkage. So that if Latvia was approaching three million people at the end of the Soviet era, it's closer to two million people now. Like a really significant uh, portion of the population has, has moved out. Um, and it's an ongoing problem. How to encourage young people to stick around. Um, the European Union is a big playground if you're a young person, uh, the sort of ambitious young person in any of these states, when they turn 14, decides you know, what Euro European language they're going to learn. Um, German, or Danish, or Swedish, or English, probably not English anymore, in order to go to university in those places, and many of them don't come back. So it's a problem. And it's a problem which is also being addressed by EU policy. There's a lot of thought about how to encourage people to return to these societies. Yeah, here. Uh, thank you very much. I guess my, my question is a, a bit of a historical one. Um, I'm, I was really fascinated uh, by your comments in this kind of interwar period, the 20s and the 30s, and thinking about this question of, of nationhood and nationality and sort of nationalist thought in these, in these contexts. I wonder if you could comment, um, are there any sort of parallel Jewish nationalist, Zionist, or Jewish socialist movements comparable to what was happening in, in places like Poland or Ukraine uh, in these contexts. And of course, I think we sort of know the tragic end of that story, but I wonder, you know, is this a moment of kind of political or social possibility uh, for Latvian, Lithuanian, or Estonian Jews? Um, in terms of, you know, socialist Jewish movements in with in, you know, in Latvia, once again, it's the case that I know best, right? Um, I think that in terms of you know, socialist mobilization and you know, radical leftist mobilization, it becomes less of a factor in these societies very quickly after the you know, declarations of independence and the creation of liberal states. But in the Latvian parliaments, um, Lithuania is somewhat different because it becomes authoritarian very quickly, and then Estonia as well. So, but the Latvian case, really up until the early 30s, is a case of a functioning democratic and parliamentary society in which there is very prominent uh, representation in the parliament of uh, all the minority groups of, the, of, of Latvia, including Jews, including the Baltic Germans, um, and to a lesser extent, other minority groups that are there as well. Um, and there are uh, problems with anti-Semitism at various points. Uh, immediately following the independence, there are waves of anti-Semitic uh, demonstrations. Uh, in the 30s, later on, there, is also, there are also problems with anti-Semitism. Um, but in general, uh, these are fairly well-functioning multi-ethnic societies uh, in which rights to you know, cultural self-determination are fairly well recognized, where you know, people have their own schools, uh, they have their own ability to, you know, have their, you know, national culture. I remember one of the first times that I was really starting to get interested in, in Riga city history. I took a, uh, a walk around the city with, um, um, he's a, um, uh, an historian. He just, he has since died. Um, the name will come back to me. Anyway. Long-lived historian who grew up in the 1930s. He was Jewish, um, and he took me for a walk around Riga. And he said, "Well, this was a block where they spoke Yiddish, and this is a block that was Jewish, but they spoke German over there. And this was a block where they spoke Latvian. This this block they spoke Russian, and it really was like I think a very vibrant, multi-ethnic um, kind of a uh, a city. Um, so 
I hope that's something of an answer. We have time for one more question. Hello, uh, yeah. just a quick question. Um, I don't know that much about, uh, I know that the Finns and the Estonians share a similar or same language family, but I'm not sure uh, how much they share culturally, how similar or dissimilar they are. And I was wondering about, through the course of the 20th century, um, what their relationship was like and how it evolved, especially after 1917. I can't give a really detailed answer to that, unfortunately, because I just don't know enough about it. They are extraordinarily close. And in the post-Soviet era, there has been the articulation of very close uh, intercultural and also interstate contacts between Finland and Estonia. Um, they're also just close in terms of territory. Um, but I don't know really the answer of the sort of long story of Finnish and Estonian uh, interactions and cooperation. So I'm sorry. Well, join me in thanking Kevin Platt. <laughs>